here's the secret that Chinese leaders don't like to admit to the rest of the world. China's rise has been producing a lot of existential anxiety in the West. People worry that China is going to exploit America's relative decline, replace it as the global hegemony, and completely revamp the international order. This is about a yeah. Communist Party leadership in Xi Jinping that is intent on global hegemony. We will remain focused on the most serious long-term challenge to the international order, and that's posed by the People's Republic of China. We will not be intimidated, and we will not stand down. That's not going to happen on my watch. Well, the problem that I have with this assumption is, if China's global initiatives are truly dangerous, then why do democracies outside the first world, like India and Philippines, never actually echo such claim? If China is truly a threat to democratic ways of life, then why did Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and basically the entire Western Europe join China's Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? to follow China's economic vision against America's objection. Saying all of this, I'm also not ducking the question that, OK, if China's rise is truly peaceful, then why did China come across as so aggressive over issues like Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the South China Sea? How do we make sense of all these? What does China really want? And how can we reasonably expect China to behave when it becomes the world's largest economy? And in this video, I'm going to make an attempt at these questions, so hopefully addressing these contradictions in a more satisfying way. First of all, the West is not completely wrong in its assessment of China's global ambition. So yes, China does want to pursue a global leadership to become a country that is admired and respected by the rest of the world. You know, understandably, that's what any great power would do. But what we are frustrated by is the idea that China wants to become a hegemonic power like America and will behave like America to export its values and to make the rest of the world govern and operate in the exact same way like China does. We think that in the past, when China was the strongest country capable of dominating the world, we had chosen not to. In China's Yuan Dynasty, between 1405 to 1433, already being the world's number one, China sent out seven naval expeditions under the diplomat Zheng He, traveling from Southeast Asia, India, the Middle East, and to North Africa. That was long before Christopher Columbus tried to find a Spice Island. China had way bigger ships already than the Santa Maria Columbus used to sail to America. Instead of subjugating the local people and taking away all the resources, here's how we behaved. At each stop on his journeys, Zheng He formally proclaimed the magnificence of China's new emperor, bestowed lavish gifts on the rulers he encountered, and invited them to travel in person and send envoys to China. Yet, beyond declaring China's greatness and issuing invitations to portentous ritual, Zheng He displayed no territorial ambition. He brought back only gift or tribute. He claimed no colonies or resources for China. At most, he can be said to have created favorable conditions for Chinese merchants through a kind of early exercise of Chinese soft power. China has its fair share of land grabbing and wars during the rise and the fall of Chinese dynasties. But the Chinese lack of ambition to dominate the foreign land has always been an intuitive thinking to guide China's relationship with the world. You can think about it like this. In Anglo-Saxon countries like America and the UK, and even Latin America like Brazil, it is possible to assimilate into an American, a British or a Brazilian, as long as you settle down and adopt the language, the custom and the ways of life. Your ethnicity and cultural background doesn't matter, right? But in China, only people of Chinese descent can be seen as a Chinese. And that's how exclusive we are. Go, go. 
I know some of you might be thinking, well, it's all right and good to say China is just a benign power and only want to focus on its people. What about when it flew its jets straight across the Taiwan Strait after Pelops' visit? What is that all about? Logically, I could argue, you know, of course it would be erroneous to say China's doing around Taiwan is any expansionist or overreaching because all of China's diplomatic relationships, for example, the US-China joint communique, are established on the one China principle. Every country has to acknowledge that Taiwan and China is one sovereign. But I know a lot of you don't feel that way, especially if you don't particularly resonate with the Chinese culture, you support Taiwan's independence. That's fine. Practically, the US can literally do what it pleases because it is still by far the most powerful country in the world. But Taiwan, look, China just could not afford to appear weak on Taiwan. Not just because it would be a political suicide for Xi Jinping to not do anything about it, but let's just say that he didn't. How would the Chinese government come across to the Chinese people? More importantly, what does that signal to the rest of the world, the West, America, about China's ability to stand for itself and to compete as an equal when it just aspired to become a world leader? Here's the secret that Chinese leaders don't like to admit to the rest of the world. Taiwan is still considered as the last piece of the puzzle unresolved from the century of humiliation. I'm going to quote an ex-president of the UN Security Council, Kishori Mabubani, who captures this really well. Taiwan, you have to know, from China's point of view, is the last remnant of the century of humiliation that China suffered from 1842 to 1949. So you're stepping on a very sensitive toe, and you have to know that. You have to understand the history behind it. At the defeat of the Sino-Japanese War, Taiwan was forced to be handed over to Japan. After the World War I, China was once reassured by the United States and Britain at the Versailles Peace Conference that its territories would be returned back to China. But in the end, not only Taiwan wasn't returned, but Shandong was rewarded to Japan. Thousands of students gathered at the center of Beijing's Tiananmen Square on the afternoon of May the 4th. What they were demanding was defend China's sovereignty punish the traitors. So the way China feels about its territorial issues carries a lot of anger and resentment. I know some people might be thinking again, why can't China just let go of this past and move on? Well, saying this to China is kind of like telling a Black Lives Matter activist, slavery just ended 200 years ago, why don't you just get on with it? So what came across as aggressive and power obsessive is coming from a place of defending, not offending. This history has taught the Chinese not to accept Western reassurances. Any move by America or any other Western power to support, directly or indirectly, the secession of Taiwan from China brings back this historical memory. It provokes a strong, powerful and virulent national reaction, which boxes in any Chinese leader who may be trying to look for room to maneuver. The message is this. We can't lose that face. As delicately as I can, I want to add a final spin on the conversation. A lot of the interpretations around China's rise by Western media and pundits are done under the shadow of American exceptionalism or Western exceptionalism. I'm not being original in this. This has been argued by many American scholars, for example, Jeremy Sachs. In 1941, Henry Luce declared the American century. In 1992, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we were the Colossus, the new Rome, uh, the sole superpower of the world. Uh, the idea that there is one power that bestrides the world, especially one country with 4.4% of the world's population presuming to lead the world, to be the superpower. This version of exceptionalism believes that the West, led by America, is a godsend force for good, the city upon a hill. We shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, constructed and inhabited by men aware of their great trust and their great responsibilities. We do not imitate, for we are a model to others. 
America is the sole superpower with the ability to impose its will onto the rest of the world. The West is the sole judge of what is right and wrong and what should be the best ways of doing things. This is also intellectually justified by an American thinker called Francis Fukuyama, who proclaimed the West triumph at the end of the Cold War. What we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War, or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such, that is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. This triumph seems to have given the West a kind of moral hubris when it looks at a country with a different civilization than its own. When China becomes more powerful in economy and technology, instead of finding possible opportunities to work together in ending poverty, terrorism, non-proliferation and climate change, the West decided that the right thing to do instead was to demoralize China. But how could China be a threat when it only has a tiny military base in Djibouti when America has more than 700 bases all over the world in more than 70 countries? And how could China be interfering and expansionist when it hasn't got involved in a single war in the last 40 years while America has taken upon itself to so many projects in... On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance. These strikes were carefully coordinated with our coalition partners. He made clear yesterday that he does not want them to live on the earth anymore. Libya, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Panama, Haiti, Granada, all over the world. I personally find it so difficult to digest the China threat theory unless I look at it from this point of view. To sum up, China's rise is a quest to create a multipolar world where China could share more of the global leadership, especially in economy and technology. But the Chinese culture isn't so keen on universalizing its values to the rest of the world, so China is unlikely to initiate any project where it uses violence and coercion to further its political agenda. However, China will definitely resort to assertive means when it comes to sovereign issues like Taiwan and the South China Sea, particularly when you feel provoked. By bringing up American exceptionalism, I'm trying to say the world's anxiety doesn't always come from China. And no, it doesn't mean that China isn't paranoid sometimes and should be more careful, but China will be firm to defend what it regards as sovereign and dignity. All right, that's my take on China's rise, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I know China is a very polarizing topic, so let me know in the comment which part you agree or not agree. And if you enjoyed this video, I would love you to support me by doing the algorithm stuff, by liking, commenting, and subscribing to this channel. Connect with me on my Instagram where I share the down-to-earth side of China, the whole look of it. It's a baby account, so come say hello and join the community. I will see you there.